If you own a business and expect to one day sell your business, you need to understand what it's worth now, what you could do to maximize the value, and how best to position it for an M&A transaction in the future. Economics Partners is Utah's premier business valuation and strategic consulting firm. Go to econpartners.com for a free consultation. econpartners.com. Welcome on in, Cougar Nation, to another post-game edition of Cougar Sports Saturday and Cougar Tracks here on kslsports.com. Both podcast feeds are available on the KSL Sports app. I'm your BYU insider, Mitch Harper, joined as always, seems like lately, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking with them each and every night here at the Marriott Center. Cougar Sports Saturday producer on KSL News Radio, Dallin Graff, filling in for Matt Biamonte. Matt, of course, covered BYU football. You can read his three observations piece on kslsports.com. So recapping BYU football's win over Georgia Southern and also BYU basketball getting a win over Central Methodist. And we'll start at the Burrito Shack. No, I mean the BYU, Georgia <laughs> Southern, the Statesboro Burrito Stand. I don't know what to make of it. The Cougars get the, get it done, 34-17. to 17. And apparently, Dallin, there were was burritos flying at Paulson Stadium. A weird, strange game, but BYU finds a way to come out, out on top. Yeah, BYU's got to stay away from these Sunbelt venues, huh? What is this? Right? Two, two, two years in a row with just... Just oddities, just you know, chippiness throughout the games. We saw it last year with Coastal Carolina on the road in Conway, South Carolina. This time in Statesboro, and it wasn't wasn't nearly as bad as the uh, as the Coastal Carolina, at least on the field. Uh, I mean, I can't yeah. speak to the burritos that were <laughs> reportedly flying, according to Kalani Satake. But uh, you know, BYU. Gets this win. It was a tight game in the first half, 20-17 to 17 at halftime. And uh, it, it just felt like BYU's defense really couldn't get a stop. The offense was rolling. Uh, second half, BYU shuts out Georgia Southern, uh, ends up winning by 17. But it was, I don't want to say an uninspiring win, but definitely not the convincing win that I think BYU fans were hoping for as it, uh, you know, comes to the end of the season and BYU is hoping to earn a New Year's Six Bowl bid. You could have used a 20-plus point victory, 17 on the road against Georgia Southern. Uh, it's a good win, but maybe not the dominating performance BYU fans expected. No question. Uh, I mean, BYU was down 17-14 to 14 in the second quarter. They dominated from there, reeling off 20 straight points. But yeah, this was a a performance that was was much uh, very much uninspiring from this BYU team, and it honestly leaves some I don't want to say doubt, but because BYU I think will probably be favored still against USC, uh, but um, you know maybe you, you feel like there there could be an upset watch potentially in LA because mm, this BYU I don't team. Know. <laughs> they gave up 62 points yeah, to UCLA. Okay. Uh, listen, I mean, did, I, it might be, it might be over me. 100. Okay. If, if, you know, I don't, I don't do, do Talk bets, me but. off the ledge there, Down. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. that. That was much needed. No, but BYU, I just felt that uh, they came out defensively, and I thought it was a little bit strange, too. Uh, Peyton Wilgar out for the year. Shoulder. I know he was a little bit banged up. I remember seeing him in the Washington State game uh, where he went out to the sideline getting looked at the trainers. But he came back in. You thought, okay, there's it's much ado about nothing. But it was a lingering issue throughout the season for Peyton Wilgar. Uh, but they go out in a 4-2-5 alignment from the opening drive. And my thought was that it just felt odd going up against a triple option. 4-2-5, five defensive backs. Now I know that they use their defensive backs in a variety of different ways. But... That just felt strange from the get-go, and then Georgia Southern just gashes them on that first drive, and they get up uh, into a scoring position, and they score a field goal. Uh, I just felt that defensively, BYU was uh, underwhelming in the first half. They made some great adjustments and completely shut out Georgia Southern in the second half, but you looked at all the metrics, all the data on Georgia Southern coming into this game. This was not a good football team, and to be you know, in that situation with 625 remaining in the second quarter – Georgia Southern had life. They believed they could win the game, and, and you were down as the 14th-ranked team in the country. Uh, I just thought uh, a little bit disappointing, but the second half, and offensively, BYU was fantastic. Can't, you can't speak uh, really any bad things about what BYU did on the offensive end. No, and, you know, I, I wrote this in my three storylines piece this week before the game that I expected didn't 
you know, for BYU's defense to struggle early in this game with a, <laughs> yeah, a unique right. offensive scheme that uh, BYU doesn't see very often. Uh, a redshirt freshman starting at quarterback in this game, and they had, you know, uh, that other player, Jones, I think number five, play some quarterback as well, attempt some passes. So, you know, a different look for BYU this week, and I thought it would be a slower start. Uh, it was definitely more of a struggle than I anticipated for the defense, but, you know, give them credit in the second half, obviously, uh, you know, pitching the shutout there, uh, getting it done when, when it mattered, and, you know, maybe that loss of Wilgar uh, affected the defense more than we would think. There's a lot of depth on this team, but Peyton Wilgar is one of their best players, yeah. uh, no doubt. He's, uh, he's a solid tackler in an area where BYU has struggled this year. Uh, he's been one of the most consistent, and uh, perhaps that loss was felt a little more to start this game than we anticipated. Uh, obviously, they're able to pull it through, but it does make you worry for next week because we know USC, uh, they might not be able to stop them on defense, but USC can score points in their own right. right. So you don't want to get into a situation where you're in a shootout in L.A. against this USC team. Uh, definitely want to get off to a better defensive start next week. Kind of crazy to think, too, that the two defensive captains out for the year, Keenan Peely, Peyton Wilgar, guys like Ben Bywater, Morgan Piper, uh, Max Tooley even had to come out due to a targeting, which, I, I mean, by the definition of the rule, yes, it was a targeting, but still it's just like there's so much gray area with that penalty uh, he was ejected, and BYU had to elevate Piper. And and uh, I'm surprised we're not seeing Josh Wilson much at all. Like mm. the younger brother to Zach Wilson, I really thought this could have been a game where give him some valuable opportunity to to get some film on out there. And I know that the dynamics of the game, it might not be the best spot to thrust him in in a situation where your backs are against the wall. Had you taken care of business in the first half, maybe it would have given you more opportunities to play a Josh Wilson and get some actual film on him. But let me ask you this, though, Dale. I want, I want to talk about this. this. This, to me, coming out of this game was a, a big storyline. BYU seals the game. It's late in the fourth quarter. Fourth and one, Tyler Algier gets a first down. Ball game, it's over. With about like, less than a minute to go, I think it was about a minute 37 remaining, BYU is clearly kneeling down. And Georgia Southern gets called for an unsportsmanlike conduct. Now, keep in mind, with the backdrop of all of this, BYU is vying for a New Year's Six Bowl game still. It's 34-17. to 17. BYU is being kind and just being willing to take the knee. I felt like I was fine with that approach. Sportsmanlike or, or being a uh, good sport, that's fine. That's the Kalani Satake way. But when Georgia Southern got called for the unsportsman, like when BYU is clearly saying, we're done, hey, great game, have a nice day, we're moving on, I would have said right there, okay, we're going for it now. We are taking a shot. We're going to go into that end zone and try to get Tyler Algier or someone into that end zone to make it 41-17. to What are your thoughts on that? Should BYU have tried to add the style points to this final score to maybe bolster that, that box score when the committee sits down in Grapevine, Texas and says, okay, 41-17, 34-17, what do you think they should have done? Honestly, Mitch, I don't think it really makes a difference. Really? I'm going to be honest. I, I think the committee is going to feel however they feel about BYU, regardless of whether it was a 34-17 win, 41-17, you could have kicked a field goal. It, like, I don't think it mattered. On principle, maybe they should have, you know, after that penalty, yep. you say, all right, well, you know, we gave you a chance, but, you, you know, maybe you, that's you want to play important. it like this. But I don't think it, as far as their college football playoff rankings or, or the way, I, I don't think it makes a difference there. 17, 24 points, that's not going to matter to the committee. A win was a win. Uh, unless they were going to, you know, beat them by 30 or 40 points, nothing was going to convince the committee of anything they didn't already believe about BYU. Yeah, and that's fair. And I think that it should be noted Style points is not a defined metric by the committee. It's, it's Everything a, subjective it, yeah. on what they do. So it, they'll decide at, at what point <laughs> they want to use style points and head to head and you know all the other factors. I just think that we know, though, from any team outside the power structure of the sport, there is a you have to be lights out good if you want to be in that system. If you want to be in the playoff, if you want to be in the New Year's Six. You have to be completely dominant, and you go against a three and seven football team that really has not been good at all year. And I just think another touchdown could have been nice. Maybe it was just simply though the unsportsmanlike, 
And then I think I would have got a little bit petty. If I was Kalani Sataki on the headset, and this is where why I'm not a head coach, I'm doing the media thing, I'd been more volatile. I'd be like, okay, we're coming at you. We're going to just throw it right down your throats. I, I would have been like, I would have been petty. I would have kind of taken a page from Kyle Whittingham because there's been years in the past where Whittingham would do an onside kick when you're up 50 to zero. That was years ago against Wyoming. Back in the day, and Joe Glenn flipped off Kyle Whittingham. Memories in the old Mountain West. But uh, I think – I just felt like, you know what, I thought Georgia Southern was a little bit uh, – I don't want to say classless, but it was chippy. You saw Samson Nakua get pushed in the back, and Puka comes to his defense. He took offense to what uh, that number 41 on Georgia Southern did. I just thought that uh, – it, it just it made no sense to me, too, Dallin, how – a team that has z- literally zero history against BYU and with BYU, and they had just this kind of chippiness element to it. Maybe it was just simply senior day, you're trying to win your last game. I don't know. But there's something going on down in the Sun Belt Conference <laughs> that it's just like never play the Sun Belt anymore. The Sun Belt, Fun Belt, it's over for just BYU don't go now. go on the road. That's what it's I guess. I, I, you know, they can come to Provo. You know, it'll yeah. probably be a better atmosphere. Uh, you know, and I, I, it's a it's a shame. You wish these. I mean, not that this game was horrible or anything, but you know, it, a unique opponent. First time these teams have ever met. You know, BYU doesn't get out to that part of the country very often. Yep. Doesn't get to play in more intimate venues like Paulson Stadium, uh, and that is a unique opportunity. That is uh, one of the benefits from independence. Uh, but situations like this will. Probably not be missed by, by BYU and BYU fans uh, once that move to the Big 12 happens. That's such a great point because that was something that did stand out to me from a takeaway from this game was good riddance to independence in these sort of games. And and the thing is is that when you, you're in the thick of independence and you'll take this over being in the Mountain West Conference, you'll take this over being in a group of five league, but – You know, these sort of games, late November, you're on ESPN+, Plus. you're just kind of out of sight and out of mind. It's just a little bit frustrating. Now, BYU is going to get back in the conversation a little bit, just simply playing a name brand. USC, not a good USC team, but a brand nonetheless. And we know sometimes the brands and the perception means more than the actual results in this crazy sport that we love. But I think that, you know, BYU, uh, this was a game that you just be happy you won. That's all you can ask for. I don't think they're going to move up at all in the college football playoff rankings. I, I don't. Uh, I think they're going to stand pat and maybe drop a spot potentially. It doesn't help matters, too, that Oregon got completely worked, and you're thinking, why does that matter at all? Well, the the, val- the strength of the Pac-12 conference decreases a little bit because they've been elevating the Pac-12 conference. Maybe the win over Utah helps BYU. Who knows? It'll be so fascinating to see what the committee does when the party goes up on a Tuesday um, <laughs> but they're going to have uh, have that all uh, going down uh, coming up on Tuesday, the college football playoff rankings. Some some positives, though, that I thought was impressive. Jaron Hall, fantastic, I thought. 17 to 29. He liked the completion rate a little bit better, 59%, but 312 yards, two touchdowns. He was running the football a little bit more, too. Five attempts, 21 yards. Uh, Jaron took a hard hit. I was getting a little bit worried for him. I thought, oh, the rib cage, is he going to be all right? But, uh, Another great performance for Jaron. Yeah, Jaron was great. Uh, fourth time this season that he's uh, thrown for over 300 yards. And, uh, I, I, you know, one thing that I've noticed throughout the course of the season is the chemistry he has with his wide receivers on those deep balls. Mm. Uh, week after week, Aaron Roderick and this offense continue to dial up deep shots more and more. Uh, and they're... Be their effective plays. They're they're huge plays for BYU. It's a huge part of their offense. Samson, Puka, Gunnar Romney, all those guys uh, hauling in big catchers from Jaron, and you love to see that because when you have such a strong run game and you can play that heavy play action, deep shots. I mean, that's such a valuable offense, and and it's part of the reason why BYU's been so potent over the second half of the season on offense. Uh, the better they've ran the ball, the better the deep shot has been, and it's resulted in an explosion of points. So I thought Jaron was good. Tyler Algier, 25 attempts, 136 yeah. yards, and a touchdown. Good to see him get some run. You know, Ideally, he doesn't get that many carries because BYU you know, seals this thing up at half, and, and he doesn't have to. But if you're you know, on the uh, Algier chasing records train, this is, this is a good performance for him. After this game, he's at 228 carries on the season. Uh, 252 is the single-season record there by Ronnie Jenkins. So he's definitely within reach. 
uh, just 280 or 279 yards behind Luke Staley now for the single season rushing record. So uh, there is an opportunity for him to, here with two games left. He'll have to have a couple more big games. But like we said, USC is going to give up a lot of points. There's going to be opportunity for Algier there. And then obviously uh, in the bowl game, you know, we'd have to see. But uh, a good performance, a solid, another solid performance by Tyler Algier. And he continues to climb those record books. Algier's a special talent, man. I mean, 136 yards. That, that guy is just so good. And his ability, too, to just always, when you need a a chain mover when you need to get that critical first down he always delivers I mean there's not many situations this year where I point to him getting stuffed I mean BYU is sometimes in the passing game you know third and five maybe they come up short in the passing game but Tyler Algier he always delivers it's a it's incredible what that guy has done this year he is so good and uh, I'm, I'm that's one of the positives that came from this game is that he put up some big numbers that gave him a chance to go into the final two games with uh, an opportunity to, one, contend for the Doak Walker because stats, I think, matter in those type of awards when you're at a place like BYU, and two, a chance to to set those records here at BYU because he is truly establishing himself as one of the great running backs in BYU history. He passed uh, he passed Luke Staley on the all-time career rushing leader. Mark, you, you had a piece on that up on kslsports.com, which people can read and see the all-time list. But he's chasing history, and he's got a chance to continue to climb up the, the, the ladder and uh, just a special talent. I think also guys that are special talents, Gunnar Romney comes back from an mm, injury, yes. five catches, 87 yards. That guy is a, uh, like a superhuman, how he can come back <laughs> from these two leg injuries, and he still puts up big numbers. And then Puka Nakua, I, I'm very interested to see what happens on Monday for him because I feel like this was a deal where maybe adrenaline kicked in and he that carried the night if he you know takes a, on that plane ride home which is already done they're back into town um, what's that going to do when adrenaline comes down and uh, it just an overnight sleep how's he going to feel on Sunday and then of course on to Monday that's going to be real interesting because we've seen from BYU players, they'll gut check it. Jaron Hall against Utah and Arizona State, and then come to find out he, he it was ribs and, and he's out. Um, hopefully, for Puka's sake, it is nothing serious. Kalani Sataki said in the post game with Rubel that uh, you know they're they're tough, they're they're going to hurt, but uh, it's the end of the year and that sort of thing. But uh, hopefully, there's nothing more there with Puka Nakua because I, th- I was a little bit worried. I, I thought that uh, that guy's going to be unavailable against USC, and you want him in that game. I mean, a guy that's once signed with a Pac-12 school and in Washington, a traditional power in that conference, you want to see him stack up against some of the talent that USC has. And Samson did a nice job, too, 68 yards. And Keanu Hill, you mentioned him on a, a tweet over the past week, I believe. And Hill is an interesting talent. I mean, Kalani said it in the post game. He feels he could maybe be the next Cody Hoffman. Hmm. And Kalani's not one to do that. He doesn't draw those parallels, those comparisons often. So when he does, it's notable. And Keanu Hill, two grabs, 65 yards. Yeah, that's not a bad uh, yeah, That's not a bad name to be associated with if you're Keanu Hill. The name that I had in mind when I tweeted about it was uh, Neil Pau. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you look at just their measurables. I mean, they're basically the exact same size, mm-hmm. 6'4", 220. Uh, and he has those same sort of skill set that Neil Pau has, that possession receiver, consistent, uh, you know, can pick up some yards after catch, has that good height. And uh, in his limited opportunities as that fourth wide receiver this year, I thought he's shown really well. And um, perhaps next year, if uh, Neil Pau does move on, uh, we'll see even more from Keanu Hill. Uh, I was, you know, what stood out to me, Mitch, watching Gunnar Romney come back in this uh, in, in this game, I just, I, I look at Gunnar Romney and I see an NFL wide receiver. I, I don't, I don't 100%. see any reason why Gunnar Romney couldn't, be drafted or selected around the position that Dax Milne went last year. Because you look at that guy throughout his BYU career and even this season, just special, just the catches at the sideline, the catches as a deep threat. I mean, he is one of BYU's best deep threats, and they have a lot of guys that are really legitimate deep threats. Gunnar Romney is legit. I hope he gets uh, I hope he gets a solid look. I, you know, I think 
uh, for a guy like Gunner uh, testing at the uh, you know at the pro day and, and, and opportunities potentially in, in some of those postseason bowls will will help him sort of get in that draft conversation. Maybe right now he's more of an undrafted free agent type guy, but I hope he gets that shot because I look at that guy and I see an NFL wide receiver. I see uh, an equivalent player to like a Dax Milne, uh, and and uh, I hope he gets that opportunity next year. That's a great take, and you got to think too that. All of the eyeballs that were on BYU last year when studying Zach Wilson, he probably got, you know, maybe an under the radar guy for some teams that are hoping he's stashed away in the seventh round. They can get great value in Gunnar Romney. So, yeah, I think on the high end, maybe if some team falls in love with him late sixth round, unless he's a freak in the testing, like it would be great if he, if he could pair his, um, you know, what he's put on film, which. It's been good. I don't think it's great. I think that he's still maybe got some of his best football ahead of him, which is which is a good thing for him. Sometimes that can be a better thing for some of these draft prospects. What hurts him is the injuries, but you hope that he just puts out those lights out testing numbers, that, as you mentioned. I mean, yeah. I think back to like Jonah Trinneman. I don't know if you remember him, but he was someone who put up like a four three forty. He really had no film at BYU, but got a you know a cup of water in in, in the, with the New York Jets and I think another team too the uh, second year with a practice squad Gunnar Romney's got to test well and if he does he will be drafted if he doesn't test well well then he's going to be a, a, a priority free agent guy he'll get an opportunity but uh, testing is going to be key for him so he's got to be healthy and, and wonder too if if he's not fully healthy to put his best foot forward does he consider running it back? I don't think he ideally wants to because he told us before the season that he's going to move on. He's, he's going to um, you know, go on with his life. He's married now. But it just you feel like if, if he is not fully 100% and he wants to have the best chance to make a living in the NFL, I feel like he could come back one more year. But uh, we will see. I like that take, though, of Gunnar Romney. Some other notables from the game defensively, Ben Bywater, eight tackles, Led the way defensively. That guy's a stud. I'm telling you, he is going to be really good for BYU. There, there's a drop off between Wilgar, P- Peely, and then Bywater, but I think Bywater's on equal footing, if not maybe better than Max Tooley. Ben Bywater is a heck of a football player. Pepe Tanavasta did a nice job. Uh, also, we got to give a shout out to Jacob Robinson. Two yeah. interceptions, and the second grab was great athleticism. A former Utah State transfer out of Orem High School. Coaches loved him coming out of high school, but it was kind of a, a scholarship numbers deal where he, they didn't have the scholarship available for him. So he goes up to the Cache Valley, enters the portal after one year. He's done a nice job. He's had some growing pains this season at the nickel spot where there's been times he's been burned. But also, you see this potential. He's only a freshman, and you're getting these flashes already. It gives him, I think, a lot of opti- optimistic looks going forward that he could be a special player in his four years at BYU. Yeah, and it's been a lot of great progress from Jacob Robinson this year. Yeah. I mean, if you remember early in the season, there was quite a few times, I remember the Utah game and the Arizona State game, where he was targeted by yes. the opposing team's offense. Actively. As, as the weakness, right, on that offense. And he took his lumps, right, he took his blows. I think he's improved throughout the season to a point now where in this game, as you said, two interceptions, that, I mean, that last interception was, I mean, he just, he just went so up and nice. got that thing, right? I mean, he, he just went up and got that thing, and that was impressive. I believe he's the first BYU player with multiple interceptions in a game since Diane Gunwalik, who did yep. it in 2017. So uh, impressive performance for Jacob Robinson, who continues to improve, and as you mentioned, with his young age, uh, just even more growth to be had for him. This secondary, which came in with maybe some question marks in the season, uh, guys who you needed to see step up, I think they've done a pretty good job across the board. Guys like Malik Moore, Jacob Robinson have made uh, great strides. Caleb Hayes been a mm-hmm. great piece for this uh, this team, and uh, it's become one of BYU's strengths on defense. Yeah, it definitely has. And, and I think also, too, uh, multiple INTs, Malik Moore against Washington State, oh, too. He yes, got two yes. picks as well. Uh, just checking that, uh, double-check. But then before that was Dian uh, in 2017. So, yeah, good stuff for BYU football. It wasn't the prettiest win. Uh, maybe in those situations, it's nice that you end up on ESPN Plus when it's not pretty. <laughs> maybe it all worked out for a reason. BYU gets the dub, thirty-four to seventeen. And hey, by the way, nine wins. Like we forget that, like lost and all that. Nine wins. I said it before the season; they were going to go nine and three. Um, they might exceed that. And I thought people felt I was a little bit bullish, like oh, like well, you're being a little bit blue goggled there, Mitch. They're nine and two. They got a chance for ten wins going into next week. Pretty cool setup. 
for BYU football. Great things happening also on the hardwood as we sh- switch gears. We're in the Marriott Center recording this one. BYU basketball gets a win. No surprise there. They took down Central Methodist. I finally learned their name, Dallin, <laughs> hours after the game is over. 97-61, to the Cougars get it done. They're 4-0 for the first time in the Mark Pope era. era. They're going to be ranked, I would imagine, next week. Where will they end up in the rankings, do you, do you think? I think it's going to be a top 15 team. Really? There have been quite a few teams okay. from the 15 to 25 range that have dropped games this week. And then you consider uh, how impressive that win was this week over Oregon on top of beating Cleveland yep. State and San Diego State last week. So BYU is, what, 28 or 29 in, in receiving votes this season in the AP poll. So they were they were this week. So they were right there at the cups cusp. And I think, I mean, I think they move up to the top 15. This is a legit team. And this early on in college football, much or college basketball, much like it was for college football for BYU it, early in the season, there's not a lot known. BYU football made an impression with Good their point. early start, earned them a top 15 ranking. I think BYU basketball is in the same spot. Not a lot known about many teams in college basketball this year so far, but we do know that this BYU basketball team is legit, and I think that they get the benefit of the doubt there. This will be one thing that maybe you, you bring up a good point there that might be missed sometimes with independence and the WCC. Because in the setups right now, football and basketball, they have to come out guns blazing with the schedule. It's got to be armed and loaded, and they've got to make a statement out of the gates because they know – when they get in the back half, like football today, Georgia Southern, conference play outside of Gonzaga, there's not many chances for statement builders. Now, I know the WCC is good this year. There might be four teams that are NCAA tournament worthy. So this year might be the outlier. But more times than not, you always have to come out just on a, you know, you got to make some statements early. And it benefits BYU in these situations where they can make an impression when, very few teams in the landscape of college basketball have that chance to make an impression, and that win over Oregon, maybe to date, might be the most impressive win of the season thus far. Now, I know all the MTEs are going to get firing up here, and there's going to be Maui and all these different events, Atlantis, so there's going to be some great games coming up over the course of uh, Thanksgiving week, but a uh, huge opportunity and, and great resume thus far for BYU through four games. And uh, I think that they, they should be in the top 15. I think they're probably going to be around 16, 17 is where I'm guessing. But we'll see how it shakes out coming up on Monday. Notables from the game, Foose Traore uh, was out due to an injury he suffered against Oregon. We knew that he got banged up a little bit. Where there was optimism that he was going to be okay. And it seems like it's going to be all right, kind of a precautionary deal. But uh, uh, I think it might be another deal where you can get by Texas Southern next week Get him ready for Utah at all cost. Yeah, and uh, you know, I thought in his stead, Gavin Baxter, fourteen minutes, yeah. thirteen points, five rebounds for Gavin Baxter, and uh, Coach Pope mentioned all those minutes came within the first thirty minutes of the game. So he didn't play the last ten minutes of the game. Uh, that was the heaviest workload that he's had, and obviously performed at a really high level. You saw Atiki Ali Atiki eighteen minutes tonight. That's the most that he's seen. So despite you know losing depth, first it was Richard Harward, now Fus Traore. Uh, BYU is getting it done. I did notice too, Mitch. There was an eight-minute stretch in the second half where Caleb Loner was playing at the five, and in that stretch, Loner had ten points, two assists. He was dominant at the five, and I loved that Mark Pope this early is is starting to experiment a little bit. What does it look like when Loner? You know, can we get a stretch of minutes where we go a little smaller, and how does that work? Loner was dominant in that, and that's going to be huge for BYU, especially if Foose is going to miss uh, any more than just a game or two. Uh, they're going to need somebody else to to eat up some minutes there, and I thought Loner at the five uh, was really impressive and just unlocks another aspect, another lineup for Mark Pope to use in his arsenal. Through four games, what do you feel is the best lineup for BYU? BYU. I think the best lineup for BYU right now. So Barcelo, Lucas. Right. Barcelo, Lucas, Gideon, George. Okay. I think those three, Loner. And then, I mean. Do you put Loner at the five? I mean, what, what? I think Loner at four, and I think you'd say Foose right now. I mean, obviously yeah. he didn't play today. I thought right. if Gavin Baxter's playing like he did tonight, well, then, I mean, yeah. that's it right there. Those are the five in that, that starting lineup, and, and that starting lineup is, is really formidable. But, I mean, Foose has played great off the bench in the three games that he, we did see him. So I would go with him for the season. But uh, Baxter continuing to get uh, more healthy and more minutes, uh, he could 
I mean, he could be the best uh, big that BYU – he should be the, B, the best B, big BYU has this season. I, I thought it was noteworthy, too, that Baxter said um, he's 100% in his knee. Uh, it's more about confidence for him, which I thought was very interesting because you think minutes restriction, it's still about the health. He's inching closer to 100%. But he says he's fine, 100%. Like that. Again, that's coming from a player – Again, maybe I'm just having what, what is it uh, PTSD from the Jaron Hall? Like, uh, <laughs> just fell on the just fell on the football, just got the wind knocked out of me. I'm okay, I'm okay. Uh, and then three weeks later, and I lost a you know Boise coming back, not fully healthy. Anyway, I, I, I digress. But uh, I, I thought that was noteworthy, and maybe you saw you know that byproduct on the court tonight against an inferior team. Yes, but still uh, to get that type of production, I thought was was noteworthy because I think after he had that injury and that road back from the ACL, you just thought maybe Gavin Baxter's best basketball is just behind him. Maybe he's never going to reach the top 100, top 100 recruit heights that was uh, placed upon him coming out of Tempe View High School. But uh, that production tonight against a far inferior NAIA team uh, gives you some hope and maybe some confidence. And I think also with Loner too, who you mentioned, He's always a guy that just fills itself out. Like last year, he couldn't make a three, and then he was tearing it up in WCC play. But this was a great performance to kind of have that breakthrough. It gave this team a much-needed breather to kind of experiment some stuff and, and get some looks on the floor before you go play Utah, which I know our guy Matt Biamonte thinks it's not going to be a, a challenge at all. I think that's going to be a tough game. Utah yeah. took down Boston College. That's going to be a tough game. It's going to be a quad one game most likely. So that's you know all eyes on Utah next Saturday. So it was kind of fun to see some uh, tinkering of the lineups and see some different personnel. Yeah, and I was encouraged by the improved three-point shooting tonight for BYU. Yeah. Coming into this game, BYU was shooting just 30.5% from three to start the season, and they were 3-0 and despite of it. Tonight, 45% from three. Alex Barcelo, four of seven. He can, I mean, he continues to, uh, to be lights so out. So good. But uh, Spencer Johnson, Trevin Nell, both those guys had multiple threes. And so, I, you know, BYU has won this season based on their defense and how strong they've been on that end and then just uh, playing smart basketball and offense and relying on Alex Barcelo. Tonight they opened up from three. And if this team's going to play as good a defense as they have – and shoot the three at an above-average clip. I mean, we're talking about a really special team. So I thought that was encouraging. Yes, it's against Central Methodist, but hopefully this gets the uh, gets the guys going because we know that there are shooters on this team, guys that can knock it down from three. BYU needs reliable three-point shooters throughout this season. I think what I marvel as we kind of wrap up the show, I think what I marvel with Barcelo the most is that it doesn't seem like he's forcing anything. Like, you know, with Jimmer Fredette, we, I love Jimmer Fredette, his time at BYU. Don't get me wrong. And I, he's, he's 1A, 1B with Danny Ainge. There's no doubt about it. Those are the two greatest ever. But I just marvel at how Barcelo, he gets everything within the system of the offense. It's not this, like, iso ball. It's just, like, he's picking his spots. He's getting an open look. Like, it's just amazing the efficiency that he plays with. And it just kind of embodies today's modern basketball. It, BYU wants to incorporate a, a NBA style under Mark Pope where it's you know utilizing the bigs to make a lot of decisions. And Pope's talked about that quite a bit with us. And I feel like you know just watching how Barcelo operates, I feel like I'm watching an NBA player. And I never felt that up until this season when watching Barcelo. I always thought he's a good college player. But I feel like I'm watching an NBA guy this year, and I think that's noteworthy. And if he truly is an NBA guy plus loner plus – Foos plus T. John Lucas. BYU could do some special things this year. Yeah, and I think a part of what has made Barcelo so special this year is T. John Lucas. I know his yeah, shooting hasn't been great to start this season, just one of eight in this game, but seven assists. Having a playmaker next to Alex Barcelo, uh, Brandon Averett was a great player last year, and he added an element to BYU's team that they desperately needed, but he wasn't the playmaker uh, next to Barcelo. Barcelo had to be the initiator, the playmaker on last year's team. Now he's uh, allowed to just, as you say, play within the flow of the offense, just take the open shots when they come. And you have a guy on the, you know, next to him in Tijon Lucas, an experienced guard who's just getting the ball to the open guys, making great passes, cross court, down, you know, in the lane, whatever it takes. Uh, he's getting it done. And I think that's unlocked Alex Barcelo to be an even greater offensive threat this year. And uh, he's scoring, I mean, 16 points on 
10 shots tonight. I mean, it's uh, it, the efficiency with which Barcelo has scored is incredible, and uh, that tandem of, of Barcelo and Lucas is uh, just going to get better throughout the season as they continue to uh, gain chemistry. Ever- Averett was really good. Tijon Lucas is an upgrade, though. Yeah. Tijon is, is a, uh, as you said, he's a playmaker. He, he really is that. I mean, if, and if he gets the shot falling like it did against Oregon – Watch out because then it's like you pick your poison offensively. <laughs> There's so many options on this BYU lineup that can knock it down from outside. I mean, get to the rim. It's, it is a versatile roster, and, and I'll tell you, they're a lot of fun to cover. And I uh, hope you guys are enjoying the content and the coverage. I feel like our BYU basketball coverage and our BYU football coverage is the uh, tops in the market, so make sure to go check it out always on kslsports.com and on Cougar Tracks and the Cougar Sports Saturday podcast feeds. This is going to put a bow on – What's been a jam-packed day? It started at 10 a.m. for us and with extended pregame of football. Then we covered the football game and then came down to Provo for the basketball game. So it's been a, a locked and loaded day, Dallin, but uh, we've had a lot of fun and uh, it's been a good time. It has. I tried a cougar tail for the first time today. <laughs> what would you think? Been, I've been to, I don't know how many BYU sporting events at this point covering the team, and I've never tried a cougar tail. It was, <laughs> it was solid. It was solid. I'm not. Good deal. Maple donut's not my first choice if right. I went to go get a donut, but I, I enjoy a maple donut, and this was a pretty, like a pretty dang good <laughs> maple donut. So that thing is big, though. I, like, yes. I, I got maybe halfway, and I was like, oof, I need to take a break. I like, you know, I had to take some time. That's definitely a shareable thing. No I didn't have, I should have shared it with you, actually, now I think about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was waiting very, for the offer, but yeah. I was like, it's, it's, it's fine. Like, it's, it's, it's your first experience. Right. I don't want to ease in on the first <laughs> of anything. You know, like, it's, whenever it's your first, it's a memorable experience. It's, it's a first. Well, so I've you, learned. It's, it, you you want to share the cougar tail, uh, <laughs> or you just got to go at it and just, just kill it, just get it done, you know? Because if you, if you wait too long, try to pace it out. It's not, it's not the plan. I mean, I'm not expecting Lady in the Tramp style here with the spaghetti. <laughs> like, I just wanted to break, broke off piece we don't need to share it on on each end just you know break off a little piece and uh, we can enjoy that cougar tail anyway uh good stuff dallin uh, again check out dallin's bylines on kslsports.com and, and mine as well matt biamonte did some great stuff too on the website kyle ireland uh, kyle ireland big shout out to him for his work on the website as well a fun day for byu sports for ksl sports Great coverage and uh, a lot of fun. A lot of exciting times ahead. We'll be going to L.A. next week for BYU football and also covering the latest with BYU basketball as well. So we'll catch you next time here on Cougar Sports Saturday and the Cougar Tracks postgame podcast.